Welcome to the EFF Gender-Based um, Desk Violence Online web series. I serve on the Portfolio Committee of Health in the National Assembly, and I'm an ordinary member of the Economic Forum Fighters. Greetings to the Commander-in-Chief, Jila Silo Malema. Greetings to the Deputy President, Floyd Nyoko Shivambu. Greetings to all the officials, all the commissars, fighters, ground forces of the EFF, ground forces in the diaspora. Uh, greetings to each and every one of you that's joining us today when we're having this important conversation. Uh, we'll be sharing our thoughts and uh, some really important discourse and narratives around sex work. Um, so primarily we understand that the EFF is for decriminalizing, decriminalization of sex work. And today with me, I've got an amazing panel, which I tricked into joining this particular conversation <laughs> by pairing them with each other because they are groundbreaking activists, groundbreaking voices in this whole conversation. I, for instance, remember this particular time, I think I forgot Amsterdam yeah, at the World AIDS Conference. And I was in the same room with Dr. T and Lucy Studio, and I couldn't say a thing because I was dumbfounded by being next to these powerful women. And I hope this particular conversation will start opening channels for us to really conceive or to really understand genuinely what we really mean when we are calling for decriminalization of sex work. It's an important conversation um, that we should have together and amongst one another. Uh, but before wasting any more time, because I can go on forever, please kindly all introduce yourselves. I think I'll do a horrible job uh, at laying out what and who you are. Um, but I'll give you a chance. All of you need to introduce you. I'm going to go this Zoom meeting. Sis, do over to you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Duduzi Lezami. I am an advocacy manager for SWET, Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task Force, the organization that's fighting for full decriminalization of sex work in South Africa and protecting the sex workers human rights. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Sis Dudu. Nosipo uh, Vitima, please, please allow us the honor of knowing you. <laughs> uh, my name is Nosipo Vitima. I'm a sex worker, first and foremost of all. Before, I'm a sex worker rights specialist uh, at Sofke Gender Justice, formerly for seven years with uh, the Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task Force, uh, last position as a program manager. Thank you so much, Dr. T. Thanks, my lady. Um, my name is Dr. Laleng Mufugeng and Kitsuakwakwa. I'm a medical doctor and I'm a migrant worker in Johannesburg. And I am a service provider um, to patients and clients, which is the first time and the first way that I was introduced into this very important issue of taking care of sex workers, particularly women and their children. I'm also the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health. 
and I am a director of an emerging um, homegrown institution called Our Equity that works on policy, health communications, research, as well as content production. Gyabong. Thank you so much, Doctor. Sis uh, Bongile, please, please kindly help us with knowing who you are on this wonderful panel today. Am I the only one who's not hearing anything? I think we must just somewhat continue while U Sisbongile figures out ways to work around the connectivity problem. Um, Cause this is a very jam packed conversation. I don't think we even have enough time to really break down into um, what we are essentially calling for and what it actually truly means. Firstly, Sis Nosipa, I wanna hear from you. Um, why the term sex work and not prostitution? What guides us into deciding that prostitution is derogatory or is not pleasant or palatable? And why do we insist on saying sex worker instead of prostitute or prostitution? Um, there are two reasons for this. Uh, one of them is that first of all, sex workers in this country have actually chosen the term uh, sex work. And this is because mainly when we're calling for decriminalization of sex work, we are asking for the recognition to be seen as workers in this country and for the services that we provide to be seen as a form of a trade or a form of a service, right? Um, but again, I'm going to go back to the, to, 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 the, to, to the thing of it being a choice because you'll find that in some other countries, uh, I mean, we've got reclamation movements. Um, people are going to say, that we're going to take this term that has made us ugly um, in, in, in front of society and we're going to actually call it and we're going to reclaim it. We're going to, it's going to be ours. We're going to re rebuild it and give it new meaning and give it new actions and give it everything. So you find that in some countries you, can, you have prostitution, prosti prostitutes collective. And that's not a bad thing. But here in this country, also this name, this is the second reason. This name comes from the terminology that was given to women who were not supposed to date interracially, women that were for a very long time forced to testing of STIs, especially syphilis. It is attached to women that would go and actually do sex work on the harbor and they'd be called prostitutes and whores. And it's almost the same as, me, as somebody calling you a slut. It's derogatory, it takes away your agency, it takes away your choice, it takes away, it, it, it enforces body policing as well. This is why we do not choose it as the sex workers movement in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a very prompt and distinct response really in relation to um, context and societies as well. Um, yes. Because what you outline is a very important thing and that's why I wanna ask Usis Tutu, um, in the context of South Africa, what preludes or what, what, how far does the activism in relation to sex workers and calling for decriminalization go? What were the movements that were started? Uh, who have been involved? Who have fell off the lines? Uh, if you can just give us a history of the activism, Ebeni Yenzayo all along, because there's masters, there's activists, people who have been part of this conversation and advocacy way before us, um, even way before some of us were even born. Um, so see students can use history activism and sex work in the South African context in Jani. Um thank you in with leadership. Um the, the history um I, I joined after I joined Sweat in 2009 and was already existed, but was not like functional because that time they were all more focusing on the on the health side. And it was very small that time when I joined Sweat. And um, when I get to Sweat, um, I met uh, Lalu and I met um, some uh, Eric Harper and I met uh, some couple of sex workers that they were already there. They, I think they were like less than 10. 
but also Koli Buteli is the coordinator and the founder of uh, Sisonke movement, the movement of sex workers. She was already there. And mm -hmm. the, the fact that when we met and we find, because Minangis Katsingi, I was very angry because of the, of the things that I was experiencing in the industry. Um, Gangfuna Velguzi and a mangi apayana umsindu amangi okupelguzi, gifunu was guzi, wine and pelguzi, giboshe three times, gis in getting your zama uksebens, getting your titties. And when I get to sweat and I met Vivian Lalu in and, and explain the importance of the advocacy, I find that how much is very important for me to be a part, and I'm not gonna be silent so much because some of the sex workers that time. On, on 2009, there were very less sex workers who wanted to come out and speak and also sharing the experience that was happening in the industry. So that was the opportunity that I get from Sweat. And then it's where I become a member of the song, the movement of sex workers, and I work with Sweat. And I become um, a peer educator. So the movement of the sex workers, we build top of whereby the already existing movement that was there was formed by sex workers who are older than us so the important thing that it was more to to make sure that the, our voices are heard and our voices and the, 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 the movement building it grows so that we can able to stand for ourselves and, and and speak on our own behalf so i started from there and then i become a a, 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 a family of sweat so the history of sweat was coming from was formed by um, sex workers themselves, and but their focus, they were focusing on highlighting the issues and the challenges that they faced in terms of, um, of, 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 of the services on HIV and address the issues of HIV. The more years goes and it's more they, they become and they come up with the advocacy work that they should be fight for human rights for sex workers. So but it was, was formed by sex workers by themselves that time. So then the movement grows and we start to become peer educators. We were 12 and then we start to um, going out and mobilize sex workers and movement building and mobilize sex workers to join, become members, but also creating environment where the sex workers can able to meet together and share their experiences, but also planning what they sh what should we do so that we can what is good for us what is bad for us what the laws that criminalize us how could we able to raise our voice together to advocate for the the, the 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 human rights for us and what is not good in the industry what we want really and then we start really to grow and really the movement it grows now the way that we are present in nine provinces and then there is a lot of sex workers who are members but here in South Africa, it's only movement of sex workers and, and only organization that uh, advocates for full decriminalization. When it comes to activism, I think the activism, it comes from the anger of being abused by the police, but also discriminated from the community. And also because of the laws that we live in, are, are, are under it, because the system, the way, the way that it fails us, and the way that for sex workers is not uh, present in South Africa, and it makes us grow, grow, and also the way that we create an environment where sex workers, we capacitate sex workers to be like empower sex workers to stand and also sharing the information amongst ourselves and learning skills to, so that you can able to stand and fight for the decriminalization in South Africa. So the, to say that how much the movement grows, it's very gross it, and it grows daily basis. And also sweat, it grows as example, part of myself. I came to sweat as a, as a, as a, as a, as a sex worker as a service user and then I grow at, inside that sweat until now today I'm a manager for advocacy but it's all about my activism the sex worker activism and the capacity that sweat provide for sex workers so that they can stand and speak for on their own behalf that is our activism that 
we're looking forward to fight for. We've been fighting for many, many years, but we're still going to fight until we get decriminalization because it's only way and it's important for us to keep on our activism and faith to say that we're fighting for our rights and getting our decriminalization in South Africa. Thank you so much, Sis Dudu. You give you. A, a very powerful account on why it is important to not center uh, voices that are outside of the industry in this particular conversation and discourse. Um, and Dr. T, you wrote a very beautiful article on, on sex work. I think it was also on Teen Magazine or Seventeen, uh, defining and telling us what sex work is. And I thought it was such a profound um, article because of the words you particularly used and descriptions you particularly gave to different industries. Um, in simple words, not even in simple words, please, uh, what do you define as sex work? Masiti sex workers, who are we talking about? Masiti sex work, what exactly are we talking about? Thank you, Naledi. Um, it's very important, you know, to understand that first and foremost, the issue of, of sex work and sex workers is a human rights issue. It's about the right of adults to make independent, autonomous decisions about how, who, when, what are the details of having sex. And for some people, those details of having sex and the consent that adults are giving to have sex with each other or even more than one person may involve money, may involve exchange of benefits. And the point of not, in fact, the point of being anti-criminalization is that ultimately the states are criminalizing and making mostly women criminals for their ability to negotiate the type of sex they want. And at the bottom line, that's what it's about. It's about being moralistic and religious towards women who society in any case views as people who shouldn't even be recipients of sexual pleasure and pleasurable experiences, right? And that society then gets very upset and judges women harshly and punishes women harshly, who then not only own up to the fact that they are having sex, they are choosing to have sex, and that in fact, while they are having sex, one of the conditions of that sex is exchange of money. And the world punishes women like that because even in sex workers, in, in the diversity of sex workers, it's still women trans, uh, um, uh, sex workers who are abused, right? By police, who are raped by police much more than you would find a male sex worker. A male sex worker sometimes is almost like, yeah, I'm a daughter, vele, male, vele, senze lento, you see? But with women, it, it, it's, it's about the policing of women's body, the criminalization of the agency of women, and that trickles across the board, right? If you look at sexual and reproductive health rights, they even tell us what to do with the pregnancies, whether we must be you know, pregnant if you want to carry on being pregnant or not. That's still the same society that wants to police and control the ability of women to do what they want with their bodies. Now, sex work, includes a variety of services from just intimacy, from you know, just talking and that companionship to physical touch like uh, massaging, like for example, um, some clients may really enjoy a particular type of dance, right? They may have a particular type of fantasy where a sex worker gets to dress up. Some people do actually have penetrative sexual contact with their clients. Some people never have penetrative sexual contact with their clients. And so criminalization of sex work only focuses on the moralizing and judging of sexual penetration and criminalizes adults for having a full spectrum of experiences of their choosing. And we know that sex workers, of course, um, it, it varies differently, right, in, in terms of the way that it's formal or informal in, in the different countries and with the different types of models. And the reason why in South Africa, we want decriminalization 
is a very important, it's a very simple answer, is that we want decriminalization to remove all criminal laws that prohibit sex work itself, along with associated activities of sex work and those laws that uh, criminalize people who are sex workers and clients of sex work. And decriminalization goes beyond just saying, well, we won't punish you anymore. We won't put you in the jail cell. But it also includes removing such bylaws, right, um, around loitering, around vagrancy, around public nuisance, around drug use, right? Because most of the time, it's the bylaws that are being used to harass sex workers, put them in jail, and then institute criminal proceedings around them. And basically, decriminalization will improve the safety of sex work and sex workers by reducing workplace related violence, like police brutality, like violence by clients, like violence by the rest of the community, because sex workers also get abused by community members as well. And they will be able to access health services, legal services, social services, and remove the stigma that usually goes with sex work. And by framing it as work, we are also then demanding the necessary labor protections that sex workers can then benefit from. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. T. Thank you so, so very much for that response. You bring up a very important thing um, in relation to drawing parallels to gender-based violence and criminalization. Um, and I would like Usis Nosipo to really extrapolate even further, Uguti, what makes uh, the gender-based violence against sex workers peculiar? What are the daily experiences? What is the lived reality? Um, and why is it such a peculiar vulnerability um, in relation to sex workers in particular, especially uh, women sex workers? Because as Dr. T is even saying, she's explaining with even the scope uh, of the police, even the scope of the community is gendered, right? And that obviously then in, instills a lot of a, a vulnerability in the environment that sex workers are in. Sisno Sipo, just briefly uh, give us something or tell us on what this particularly means in reality, in manifestation. Okay. What do we mean by sex worker gender-based violence and femicide? Why is it a particular thing on its own? Uh, the first report that we actually had was the Lancet report, um, which highlighted to us that uh, sex workers are 18 times more likely to be murdered than the ordinary woman. Uh, this already gives you the, 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 the scope into how dangerous it is for sex workers, not just because of the of the, the, the industry they're in, but because of the criminalizing laws and the marginalization that comes from the criminalizing laws. Um, the second study that we actually did was the, the interbehavioral inter study that was done here in South Africa with Department of Health, along with other few organizations. And this study itself showed that three in five sex workers had experienced forms of sexual violence from police officers uh, within 12 months. Um, we then went on to, to actually do a campaign of our own, which is called the CNN campaign. Um, and it was to highlight and to document and to capture the, 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 the femicide and the, the sexual gender-based violence that actually happens to sex workers, but recording specifically where it ends into, fertility, into fertility where women die. Uh, and it was to focus on women sex workers. And both reports that we've had in this country from uh, 2014 up until 2019 uh, has more than over 100 deaths um, per report, right? So the first report had three years in it, and it was 157 sex workers that had died. The next report had over just over 100. It was for two years, 2018 and 2019. And it had just over 100 fem um, women sex, sex worker deaths recorded on it. Most of them are brutal. Um, it, they related to sexual uh, violence. They related to people posing as clients. They related to intimate partner violence. They related to sex, to, 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 to um, police violence. But what is astonishing is that 
out of that over of, of that hundred or over a hundred that we had in both reports 50 percent of them is through sexual gender-based violence specifically it's not hiv related because of systemic violence it's not um uh other kinds of of deaths it's specifically based on sexual gender-based violence and we're the only we're the only country that actually does this documentation so this can already give you the picture of this 18 times more likely to be murdered is not a joke. This is the reality of what we have on the ground. And women sex workers are dying. They're dying because of the laws. They're dying because of the vulnerability. People know that they are the targets and people will rape and then kill sex workers. Even police officers know they will rape and kill sex workers without any accountability. We have very few cases or just over five cases where there actually has been justice and people have been prosecuted. And this is the reality. Thank you. Yo, with the numbers you're raising and the justice rate, it's pretty obvious to see the picture um, of how gruesome it is to be a sex worker in South Africa. Um, and these are things that can be remedied, obviously. And part of our concerns, maybe from the outside and partly from the inside, is the relationship between the sex worker and the pimp. Sisbongile, this is for you in particular. Um, how then does decriminalization find maybe the concerns that are raised uh, are a bit disingenuous because people always find a reason on why not sex work must be decriminalized um, instead of why it should be decriminalized. Um, so there's that disingenuousness in the conversation as well, but important nonetheless, especially because we highlight that the vulnerability surrounding the environments of sex work uh, is a reality. What then becomes, what do we make of the pimp in relation to decriminalization? How does the vulnerability at the hands of pimps in particular um, become countered or remedied through uh, decriminalization? Is there a role that they play uh, in an instance where sex work is decriminalized and there's no more a need for protection, um, particularly for people who want to take and abuse in exchange uh, for space and protection of some sort of immunity. Uh, where do we then place the pimp? Is there a possibility of a healthy relationship as there is in other industries in relation to leasing a place or renting a place um, or being an employer for someone or an institution? Where do we place the pimp? in particular, and if there's a better word to even describe this, please also let us in on that. But in the context of decriminalization, a society where decriminalization is then a reality, what do we then make of the pimp? Sispo Nile. Oh, I think she left us. I think she left us. Dr. T, please kindly catch that one for us. I'll also pose the same question to Usis Duduzile uh, Lamini also on this particular point. Okay, look, there are reasons why sex workers have to work in more than one or two people, right, as a group. Because remember, under criminalization, and we've just spoken now, and Nosipo has told us about the type of violence sex workers face. First and foremost, it's for protection. There is some feeling that in numbers, we will be better protected. So even if there is two, three, four, or five of our sex workers, which we know our workspace is this one here, whether it's internally or external workspaces, there is some feeling of safety. The other thing is that a lot of people, right, do get services and other industries get services of private security, for example, either to guard their house, or to guard their property at work or in, or in none of those things. So the idea of having a, another person whose purpose is there for protection is not foreign or an exclusion, um, a, 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 a special circumstance to sex workers. A lot of sex workers, by the way, um, will get their property also confiscated, right? So if you are out to then go meet a client, when you come back, your space, your place, your flat, your accommodation, wherever you are, may be, um, you know, um, vandalized, your goods may be stolen. And it is within this criminalization status that doesn't allow sex workers and the sex work industry to actually formalize and come up with industry standards 
that they can implement because you are still criminalized. For as long as you can punish me for doing this work, the industry itself cannot develop, cannot, uh, 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 in terms of um, uh, 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 regulations even, right, have they. And remember, criminalization is very different from legalization. And these questions are important to have, Naledi, because sex workers themselves should be able, by the way, right, as human rights are universal, they apply to all people, and every person is entitled to the highest attainable standard of health, privacy, liberty, security, right? Security, freedom of expression and assembly, gender equality, freedom from violence, freedom from arbitrary arrest, all of these things. If, if I'm, for example, working outdoors and I have two or three uh, colleagues of mine who are sex workers and, and the police arbitrarily arrest me, Who's the person who's going to physically go and get that money out of the ATM to bail me out? So the, the presence of other people within the sex work industry is not inherently violent, but we know that sex work does happen in a violent society. Even those relationships themselves are then, you know, a, a, a have a potential to turn violent, to turn abusive, but those are not inherently sex work or sex worker issues of third party um, or, or people who are involved. And it's only when we are having decriminalization that we can truly start to talk about sex work as work and come up with labor standards and come up with what it should look like in terms of a policy of a model of then having sex workers, having sex work, and then having the third parties involved. Because for example, going to your bank and, 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 and banking your money as a sex worker, that's a third party involvement. We don't call banks pimps, right? We understand that they offer a particular service. So we need to allow sex workers and the industry to define what all of these are for themselves. But currently the most important thing is that sex work is physically unsafe. So we do need sex workers who are working in numbers and they do work in numbers, whether indoors or outdoors. But unfortunately, because of the racial discrimination as well, it's still black women who are sex workers who are most likely to be harassed by police because they are the ones who don't have the posh luxury uh, uh, accommodation and flats that are overlooking the beach frenzy or Gosentin. So the harassment again is not just gendered in terms of women, cis women and trans women, sex workers versus male sex workers, but there's also a racial element. And this is why as black women, we support decriminalization of sex work because we understand that that fallout, any negative impact will always disproportionately impact black women who are sex workers, those who work outdoors, definitely those who... So these questions are important, they are dynamic, but ultimately we can't have them within the criminalization context. We need sex work to be decriminalized first and then we approach the issue as a healthy environment work issue. Absolutely, Doctor, what you're saying is actually very true because we have space for those kind of gaps in relation to other laws that we want to be repealed or amended um, or even removed completely from the constitution. We have space to say that conversation we will have afterwards, right? Uh, that is why I'm saying that even in these conversations, and I'm happy you outlined it so perfectly, that some of the things that are raised as concerns um, are actually very disingenuous because it is not a concern for the preservation of life. It is not a concern for the preservation of human rights. It is not a, con a conversation or a concern around the security uh, of sex workers and the, the quality of life at that. Um, and since Tutuzila Lamini, you know, you speak very passionately about sex workers' children um, and how sex work particularly affects them and decriminalization in particular. Um, if you can just take us through that whole narrative and conversation on why, even for sex worker families, uh, even for sex worker communities where they live and the communities that they live in, why decriminalization? would be important um, for a four-year-old Tobani whose mother is a sex worker, whose mother can't care for him, um, who relies on a, a, another institution to care for their child. What is the link that we can draw between a decriminalization, not only being a place of justice for sex workers, um, 
but a very vital aspect for justice for the collective and the community that the sex worker lives in, in particular, sex workers, children, and their families, and, their, and the youth in the community as well. Um, thank you, Nalit. Um, I will start from the beginning that of uh, being a, a woman and goes to the, the, the street, what makes you go there? Um, what is important people that they do not understand and, and, and do not have a, clear, a clarification because they never have been there. So what makes a woman go to the street? It's because of working in the industry. It's because of the family. And also it's because of obvious the children. So the criminalization, the way that it's affect, it affect the woman that is working in the industry, but also not the people that they put it, they never know that how much the criminalization affect these women and also affect the families. The criminalization is affecting our families, affecting our children because the stigma and discrimination toward the children of sex workers, it's very, 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 it, 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 it's a problem because it's affecting them double, specific for children that are affected by HIV also. Those children are growing up in environment of the discriminated be, uh, be from the community, and they are not able to cope because of the the issue of the criminalization. It's affecting them. The fact that even the law that criminalizes sex workers is saying that it's indicating that the people who are living on the on, on the proceed of, of of sex workers are also criminalized. So also the families are criminalized and also the, the, the children of sex workers are criminalized. What happening in, 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 in children of sex workers, the most the study that we've, we've done with the global promise was indicating how much children of sex workers are affected by this, these laws. They grow up with angry. They grow up with, uh, they are very angry with their mothers. They are not finishing their education. They're not able even to, to cope in schools because also they're experiencing the discrimination from the other children they getting they also experiencing bullied by other children so the criminalization act itself it's affecting more the children of sex workers too and the families because the fact that the woman it's going sex workers are going to work to provide and support their children and sex workers are breadwinners even when the sex workers they provide in their families when they died about gender-based violence that they experience within the industry. The families are left with no closure because they do not know who killed this, the, the, the mother. And they do not know what is going on about the cases. There's a lot of cases that are left out without really closure. Also those children, those things are affecting the children. So criminalization, the decriminalization, I like for the fact that if the people always asking me, why are you pushing? Why are you guys pushing for decriminalization? Because this decriminalization will be open for children to come in the industry. I always say, I rather get decriminalization, not for only for sex workers, but also for youth and also for the future of South Africans. Because this industry, when people choose to enter by choice, it's not safety. And I advocating for food decriminalization so that I know for the fact in after decriminalization, every each woman or male sex worker or transgender choose to enter in the industry. They will be healthy, they will be saved. That is a very important, but also I know for the fact that they will be able to provide provide for their family safety and when they're going to work they will come back home unlike now even the sex workers when they're going to work and you're not you're not sure that you'll come back home or you're going to sit in the jail or you're going to be killed and by the end of the day those cases th those case is not going so now criminalization it's making uh, sex workers life a mess and their children and being affected by every each gender-based violence that is happening in South Africa in double and the discrimination that sex workers are going through from the community. So the crime is not for sex workers only, but it's all South Africa. It's important for South Africa that they must speed up for decriminalization so that every each woman who choose this type of work 
are really safety and healthy but also it's not going to be only them but it's going to be a healthy family and healthy children but also the community too will be happy and healthy and safety and they will be supporting each other so the decriminalization is very important but people they must think that if they support the crime is because of their support for 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 me or they support for for those sex workers who come out and say I'm a sex worker no we're building a future mm-hmm. for every each woman who choosing to be, be a sex worker but that is going to save a lot of families and lots of women who die in the industry and those cases not being recognized that is a decree that will make for everyone a win win solution it's not only for sex workers only but it's a whole south africa future and also provide for a, a youth that tomorrow will choose to be sex workers but they will be safe that is important of the decriminalization as a win win solution thank you Thank you so much sis Tutuzile. Thank you so much Nosipo Vidima. Thank you so much Dr. T. Um and in her absence Usbongile Shobe as well. Um I've had a very in-depth conversations with her in relation to children of sex workers and the kinds of uh catastrophes they come across. For instance, not even having a simple thing as a birth certificate. Not because you're unable to, but because your mother is a sex worker. Um and I think yes. morally as a country that's where our morals should lead us towards not whether somebody is having sex and getting money for it um our moral fiber is definitely skewed as a country if we can dismiss human rights if we can dismiss human rights uh, if we can dismiss the right to healthcare the right to life the right to dignity and all these other rights you mentioned as well Dr. T that are embedded in our bill of rights and our constitution as well um not because of anything else but because there's a trade of sex happening and primarily because someone is a woman because there's also an element of gender based violence that is particularly focused uh, on women in particular um i really appreciate that we had this conversation i hope that more of these kinds of conversations will happen uh, and i'm particularly also grateful even to the dsg komisa popi mailula um for making room in the gender based uh, desk gender based violence desk of the EFF in the web series um because these are the important conversations and we get a lot of backlash and i'm sure all of you can even uh, relate to this particular thing and because you've been in this sort of acting for pretty a long time you get a lot of backlash you get isolated um you get victimized you get discriminated against um but just to affirm that your efforts are not falling Uh, or an on an watered ground the soil is definitely fertile there's many and numerous other activists that are rising from the efforts that you plant um in the country in our lives in our interpersonal relations and conversations as well um and i just want to affirm you on that particular point but just for parting shots uh, because we've covered quite a few uh, i would wish we'd cover even more <laughs> um because there's definitely room to even go into it much more deeper um but that's for another day just for parting shots we can start with a uh, usisno sipo vidima on her parting shots on this particular conversation please i think it's 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 very important for us to highlight what decriminalization actually means for south africans and means for south african women especially after a time in a, a a situation where we found a lot of people being unemployed um during during the the pandemic uh and 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 the lockdowns that happened but also with them being unemployed and the fact that people could actually go into institutions to claim back monies that for the, for the work that they put into to the country for the taxes that they put into the country um and be able to actually survive you know um and then you have women that have been doing sex work for 20 years for 20 to 30 years of course we paying vet because when you vet is paid at every shop that you possibly can go into uh you paying it even when you going to a doctor or for a consultation when you sending your kids but for the very first time it very became very apparent that we are secondary citizens um in 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 the fact that when we can't work nobody will comp- compensate us or give us something 
to show that we've been participating in the economy like everybody else. We uh, and, and and this is what happened. Um, it, it, it's it's said also that it took this pandemic to realize just how deep. Uh, not being seen as a worker really means. Uh, because if we've been asking for this for 20, over 25, I'm sorry, there's a kid in this house. <laughs> uh, uh, and she just woke up. <laughs> um, it, 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 it said also that it took us 25 years. We've been lobbying for decriminalization of sex work for 25 years, which is basically us asking the government to say that, please see us as workers, we don't just wanna only pay that, but we wanna participate in the mainstream of the economy. We wanna pay taxes so that one day, should I, de should I decide that I'm gonna retire, I know that I can, I've can i contributed enough to a pension fund so that the same cycle of poverty, which is what we're trying to break in this country because of our histories um, with the economy and oppressions and, and, and colonization and whatnot. And that's what everybody's trying to do, right? But you find that sex workers who put in a lot of work and as much or as best as, as, as almost the entry level or what we see today as the young professionals or the entry level professionals cannot actually do this for their kids because they are not seen as workers. So I would urge, really, really urge the government that it cannot take another five years again to get to another pandemic again for us to realize that some people in this country who participate and pay into the country have not gotten their dues. I mean, it was very sad because we had traders even, um, informal traders and vendors who were able to actually go and knock at some certain doors and get uh, some sort of, of compensation for the pandemic, but sex workers could not. Thank you. Sister Tuzile Lamini, your parting shot, please, uh, just so we can close off this conversation. Please let us know what you would like to leave our viewers at home, the thoughts that should linger in their minds uh, way after this conversation. Thank you. Uh, what I can say is, um, because Nosipo is highlighting a lot then, so what I can say is that I'm asking the community to start now and support sex workers, not to discriminate them, but also supporting the campaign of decriminalization of sex work in South Africa, and also not to discriminate the children of sex workers from the community. I can say to South Africans and uh, also political parties to ask them to speed up the process of decriminalizing the sex work because we have been uh, making a noise, we have been sending uh, a request, we have doing lots of lobbying for years, uh, asking for full, for, excuse me, for full decriminalization of sex work. What I'm asking now, um, the political parties, they must do the best now for, for sex workers and hear their voices. It's what I can say um, also to remind them that uh, sex workers are human beings, sex workers are voters. Uh, when they come to vote, they vote, but also sex workers are breadwinners, they are workers and they're working um, very hard to support uh, their families. If that uh, government should be recognized them now, it's enough that we've been making a lot of noise. And during the um, um, COVID-19 sex workers, they were really, uh, struggling and suffer because of even government during the COVID, never even put them in plans, never put them first, never even recognize that there is uh, workers that they've been not even put in plans. So now I think that um, this uh, need to be taken serious for a decriminalization of sex work. We need it and I think we want it. It's time now for government mm -hmm to keep his promise to decriminalize uh, sex work is time. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. T, your parting shot. Thank you so much once again. Mm. So I'm just going to reiterate a few things, right? That sex work is work. Um, this is a very simple um, statement, but it does allow the framing of sex workers, not as criminals or victims 
or vectors of disease or sinners, right? But they are workers. And this term was adopted in the 1970s, right? At the beginning of the global women's rights movement, but also an intersectional sex workers movement. Um, so it's very important to understand that what South African sex workers are asking for is not um, to be treated any differently or you know, in, in any special way. It's literally first and foremost about earning and generating an income. The other important thing is that to remember that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work and protection against unemployment. And these provisions, by the way, I expanded upon, right, in the Covenant on Econo Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, um, which most countries, including South Africa, has ratified. South Africa has just recently done a lot of work in terms of the International Labour Organization, which is a UN body, right, around sexual harassment in the workplace. So we need to start expanding our definition of the workplace, expanding on what we mean about uh, violence to include sex workers and, and, and understand that, in fact, it is the state's obligation to ensure that not only um, they recognize sex work as a right to work, which includes, of course, the right of everyone to the opportunity to gain a living out of the work that they do, which is what sex workers are saying. They also pay rent like every other worker does. They also contribute to the economy um, like every other worker does. The only thing is that why must they be punished and criminalized and have a criminal record for 10 to 15 years, where even if they wanted to do anything, they can't simply because the state, the state has taken upon itself to punish women who dare have sex and who dare charge patriarchy for having that sex. So we need to understand that these issues are human rights issues. Let's, I mean, the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, which is CEDO. South Africa has recently delivered a report there. What does that report say in terms of the expansion, right, of what work is and what participation of women is in the economy, in the political sphere? So just not to go too far, a lady, it's just very important really to understand that decriminalization of sex work is important it's a demand that has been there for many decades now in South Africa, and it is time that it happens. We saw with COVID-19, the rapid changes in policy that were needed, the mobilization of resources, the updates in terms of data collection, um, we know that it can happen. So decriminalization of sex work is a demand. It's not an ask, it's a demand to protect to promote human rights of all people including thank you so rights. much doctor thank you so much sister Tuzile Lamini. thank you so much Nosipo Vidima. i appreciate that you guys made time to have this conversation with us with our constituency and all the people that follow the eff uh, social media pages it's a very important conversation once again and i hope we will have this even beyond this moment um because i know that the activism does not stop here uh, and i welcome each and every person I mean, to this conversation, whether to learn or to unlearn. Uh, it is one of those uh, journeys that we have to take by not centering ourselves as human beings, but centering each other and the lives of others as well. Um, and we also send a very huge shout out to the gender-based violence desk of the EFF for continuing to archive and document this kind of work. It is important. It is not something that we take for granted because political parties don't want to associate to issues that affect people on the ground, to issues that affect women in particular. Um, there's been other online services regarding child molestation, regarding intimate partner violence and queer relationships, regarding the sterilization case, the forced sterilization case, um, regarding femicide, regarding rape, and all these other wide spectrum of topics within the framework of gender-based violence. Um, and thank you once again. I really, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate that you made the time and your busy schedules. Some of you are even unwell. 
but definitely slaying Goliaths out here on this <laughs> Zoom meeting. Dr. T, you know, see poses to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and watching. Let the conversation continue. Uh, we must decriminalize. It's not an issue of asking, as Dr. T says, it's a demand, and we must all uh, concede to this demand. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Amen.